Now in the introduction, notice as we discuss the modern state of Israel in Bible prophecy, we'll begin by pointing out some of the different perspectives. There are five different perspectives on this question. We'll uh, discuss the first three in the introduction. We'll discuss the fourth one at the bottom of the first page, and I'll be presenting a fifth perspective. But the first view is that of replacement theology. And again, the two key men are responsible for innovating that theology. First was um, um, Origen, who introduced the allegorical method of interpreting the Bible. But in this case, he applied that method to all parts of the Bible, including the historical sections. What was important for him was not the obvious meaning of the text as it is written, but a deeper hidden spiritual meaning. But then came Origen, who, in, who used that same method and applied it more specifically to Bible prophecy and to God's covenantal promises to Israel. And um, he, he invented what is now called a millennialism. Now, premillennialism teaches Messiah will someday return and he will inaugurate the messianic kingdom. But the amillennial view says there's no such earthly kingdom, no such little kingdom. And the thousand year period is simply a symbolic number between the first and second coming. And so actually we are now already in the millennium and in the messianic kingdom. As I said before, if this is the messianic kingdom, we must be in the slum section of the kingdom. It's simply not as nice the Bible describes it. So when Israel rejected the Messiah, they teach that God took away the covenantal promises and transferred them to the church. They also recognize the church does not fulfill these um, prophecies literally and therefore must be fulfilled symbolically. And so all that God intends to fulfill is being fulfilled spiritually in, by, and through the church. And that became the dominant view from the beginning of the fourth century onward because we know from many early church writings dating back to the second, third, and fourth century, the church as a whole was premillennial. They really believed that the Messiah would return to inaugurate a kingdom. But that was, the, by the end of the fourth century, that was replaced by amillennialism, no kingdom, no millennium on this earth. And, um, and therefore, there, it is useless to, um, to believe such a thing. And that is still the downward position of the visible church. The majority of the visible church still holds to that kind of formal replacement theology. The second perspective disagrees with the first one. It does believe that God will someday fulfill these prophecies literally in, by, and through Israel. However, they have a hard time fitting the modern Jewish state in Bible prophecy. And therefore, they do agree with the first view that the modern Jewish state is merely an accident of history. It does not fulfill any prophecy. So again, they disagree with the first view that these prophecies will someday all be fulfilled quite literally, but the modern Jewish state simply does not fit these prophecies and therefore it's simply an accident of history. Let's look at three passages that this view has problems with and for the first example, turn to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 30. The book of Deuteronomy chapter 30. And notice the chronological sequence he gives concerning Israel's restoration. Chapter 30, verse 1, Deuteronomy 30, verse 1. And it shall come to pass when all these things that come upon you, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before you, and you shall call them to mind among all the nations, where Jehovah your God has driven you, and shall return unto Jehovah your God, and shall obey his voice and control that I command you, this day you and your children, all your heart and all your soul, that then... Jehovah your God will turn your captivity and have compassion upon you, return and gather you from all the peoples with the Jehovah your God has scattered you. If any of your outcasts be out of most parts of heaven, from thence will Jehovah your God gather you, from thence he will fetch you, and so on to the end of the chapter. Notice he points out in verses 1 and 2 that no matter where the Jews are living, they'll all come to faith. A result of them coming to faith, then there'll be this regathering. But it's a regathering as a believing people. 
Because people of the modern Jewish state of Israel, they recognize it to be primarily a secular state. A uh, good 80% of the Jewish population in Israel will class themselves to be either atheistic or agnostic. 20% are orthodox, um, but uh, they have no, spe no specific attitude positively toward Jesus being the Messiah, for example. And so the modern Jewish stage just doesn't seem to fit a prophecy like this. A second example of, of what they have problems with, you can see in Isaiah chapter 27. Isaiah 27. Isaiah chapter 27, we'll look at verse 12, Isaiah 27 and verse 12. And it shall come to pass in that day that Jehovah will beat off his fruit from the flood of the river on the brook of Egypt. You shall be gathered one by one, or your children of Israel. And it shall come to pass in that day that a great trumpet shall be blown, and it shall come the ready to perish the land of Assyria, and they that rock is the land of Egypt, and they shall worship Jehovah in the holy mountain at Jerusalem. In verse 12, notice that the gives us the northern and southern border of the promised land and points out that the Jews should be gathered one by one until all Jews are back in the land and for the first time possessing and settling in all of the promised land. But in verse 13, he points out that the well be what the Jews will be motivated by to come back to Israel is to worship the worship Jehovah in the holy mountain at Jerusalem. The early days of the Zionist movement was primarily a secular movement. Initially, the Orthodox Jews were opposed to that movement as a result of the events of the Holocaust that most Orthodox Jews now support with a couple of exceptions here and there. But um, the modern state of Israel was uh, formed through the Zionist movement and the motivation was to provide a safe haven for the Jews to survive uh, uh, without facing anti-Semitism. And that was the motivation for Zionism and the modern Jewish state. So modern Jewish state does not fit a prophecy like this either. One more example, Ezekiel chapter 39. <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 39. And we'll begin with verse... Um, Verse 27, chapter 39, verse 27. We now brought them back from the peoples and gathered them out of their enemies' lands and am sanctified in them in the sight of the nations. They shall know that I am Jehovah your God in that I caused them to go into captivity among the nations and gathered them unto their own land. I'll leave none of them any more there, neither will I hide my face any more from them. For I put out my spirit upon the house of Israel, says the Lord Jehovah. And notice in this we gather the scribes, there will be a place that the surrounding nations will be honoring and be supportive of. And the coming back is the believing people. And notice he points out that the spirit will have been put out upon the people and the whole nation. And yet then for the modern Jewish history of Israel, you have the surrounding nations opposed to Israel and trying to destroy Israel and uh, there has not yet been any massive outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the nations. So second view looks at these passages and they have a hard time fitting the modern Jewish state into these prophecies. So in the end, while they agree with the first view that, um, these, that the modern state of Israel does not fulfill any prophecy anywhere, it is simply an accident of history, but they disagree with the first view in that a day will come when God will fulfill these promises to Israel. You have a third perspective. The third perspective is that what we are now seeing is simply the beginnings of Israel's final restoration. It's the beginnings of the three passages that we have just uh, read. And more and more Jews will come back into land. At some point, they're not quite sure when, there'll be a, there'll be a national salvation. And see, because this is now the beginnings of the final restoration, it is mandatory for all Jews around the world to get up and move to Israel. And living outside the land of Israel, they're living in sin. 
Uh, we have one of our branches is, is in uh, St. Petersburg, Russia. We planted a rather large Messianic congregation in St. Petersburg. And emissaries came in of this their perspective, teaching the people there that, they, that uh, it's good to believe in Jesus, but that will not save them. To be part of the salvation package, they must move to Israel. If they live outside of Israel and die, they'll still be lost. And so salvation is now an issue of where you live and not so much what you believe. And the Messianic congregation I was a member of when I was living in California, and an emissary came in, began to tell the Jewish believers, if they continue to live in the flesh parts of America, they'll fall under divine judgment. They are, they are being called and mandated to return to Israel right away. And the elders of the congregation asked them some evidence from scripture, so he took him to Jeremiah chapter 1551. I was talking about the Jews returning from Babylon. And when they pointed out that's what it says, his response was when Jeremiah wrote Babylon, he really meant uh, as a symbol the USA. And I was surprised Jeremiah, I'm sure. And when the others pointed out that also mentions the Euphrates River, his response was, when Jeremiah said the Euphrates River, he really meant the Mississippi River in the USA. So because this is the beginnings of the final restoration, it is mandated for all Jews to return, especially Jewish believers must return or they'll be living in sin. And it's this uh, groups of this third persuasion that raise tons and tons of money to help Jews move to Israel, which by itself is not a bad thing. The trouble is they follow a strict policy never to witness to the Jews with the gospel, never share the gospel with the Jewish people. And they claim that God led them to do this, so while they are evangelical, they're just not evangelistic. Figured that one out. And therefore, um, uh, they, they claim that, uh, that they, God did not call them to witness the Jewish people. And they claim the Lord led them to take the stand, but uh, they actually fall into Satan's trap. Satan does not want Jews to receive the gospel of the Messiah. And now he's even using evangelical groups that have a strict policy not to share the gospel with the Jewish people. Now the, now the fourth uh, perspective, we'll talk about it a bit later. But the capital B, what these first three groups miss is the fact that the Bible speaks of two different worldwide regatherings of the Jewish people. First of all, there is a worldwide regathering in unbelief, in preparation for judgment, and specifically the judgment of the tribulation. Then there'll be a second worldwide regathering in faith, in preparation for blessings, specifically the blessings of the Messianic Kingdom. The three passages we just looked at speak of the second worldwide regathering in faith in preparation for the blessings of the kingdom. And we agree that the modern state does not fulfill those specific uh, prophecies. But what, this prof what the modern state does fulfill is other kinds of prophecies that speak of a worldwide regathering in unbelief in preparation for judgment. Now, uh, I won't say too much more about the second worldwide regarding faith in preparation for blessing because that'll be a topic for next week in our final study of this series. And so next Thursday we'll conclude with the second worldwide. Our focus tonight will be fo focusing on the first worldwide regathering in unbelief in preparation for judgment. And so for the remainder of our study, think in terms of three plus one plus three. 3 plus 1 plus 3. We'll start with three passages that clearly speak of a different kind of worldwide regathering than those which, which we just read. Then we'll go to a plus 1, which will, which will deal with the fourth perspective. And then we'll go to the plus 3, which will be on page 2. We'll talk about three other corollary issues involving the modern Jewish state in Bible prophecy. So we're dealing with the first three. Let's begin with Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 33. Ezekiel 20, verse 33. As I live, says the Lord Jehovah, surely with a mighty hand, 
and with an outstretched arm with wrath poured out while I be king over you. I will bring you out from the peoples and will gather you out of the countries wherein ye are scattered with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm with wrath put out. And I'll bring you into wilderness of the peoples and there will I enter the judgment with you face to face. Like as I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I enter judgment with you, says the Lord Jehovah. And I will cause you to pass under the rod now bring you into the bond of the covenant. Now purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me. I will bring them forth out of the land where they sojourn, but they will not enter into the land of Israel. You shall know that I am Jehovah. Now these verses notice he's drawing a parallel with the Exodus. At the Exodus under Moses, God brought the entire people of Israel out of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness of the Sinai Peninsula. In God's plan and program for Israel in the Sinai was to accomplish two things. First of all, they were to receive the Mosaic law, and then secondly, to build the tabernacle through which much of the law could then be maintained. And then with these two things accomplished, they were to press on and enter into the promised land itself. Because of a series of memorings and embarrassings against God's revealed will, at the oasis of Kadesh Barnea, which was right on the border of the Promised Land, God entered into judgment with the Exodus generation. And uh, with that attempt act of rebellion, the, they crossed the port in return, and now God withdrew the offer of the land from the Exodus generation. They will not have to continue wandering in the desert till 40 years pass. In a 40 year period, all who came out of Egypt will die out except for the two good spies and those below the age of 20. And so four years later, there was a new generation, the wilder generation that was reoffered the land, which they accepted and entered the land under Joshua. That historical frame of reference becomes the background for something prophetic. Now he points out, he'll regather Jewish people from all the different nations from all parts of the world. Now notice it's a gathering out of wrath in verse 33 and 34, it's a gathering for wrath in verses 35 through 38. It's both a regathering out of wrath and a gathering for wrath. The wrath out of which the modern state was born was the wrath of the Holocaust. But also facing now another time of wrath, the wrath of the tribulation. And by means of the tribulation wrath, the rebels are going to be purged out. Those who survive, he says in verse 37, will be brought into the bond of the covenant, brought into the bond of the new covenant, undergoing a national salvation, and then they'll enter the millennial Israel, the Israel, the Messianic kingdom, under King Messiah. But us here he's speaking of a different kind of worldwide regathering, a different kind of chronology. They come back in unbelief, undergo divine wrath, or bring them to national salvation, and then they move into that final restoration for the Messianic kingdom. Another example is in chapter 22. Well, chapter 20 focused more on the land in general. Chapter 22 focuses more specifically on Jerusalem. Verse 17. And the word of Jehovah came to me, saying, Son of man, the house of Israel become dross unto me. All of them are brass and tin and iron and lead in the midst of the furnace and they are the dross of silver. Therefore thus says the Lord Jehovah, because you're all become dross, therefore behold, I will gather you into the midst of Jerusalem. As they gather silver and brass and iron, lead and tin in the midst of the furnace, to blow the fire upon it and to melt it, so will I gather you in my anger, in my wrath, and I will lay you there and melt you. Yea, I will gather you and blow upon you with the fire of my wrath, and you shall be melted in the midst thereof, as so is melted, Mr. the furnace, so shall ye be melted, Mr. thereof. Ye shall know, I, Jehovah, put out my wrath upon you. Focusing on Jerusalem is a similar pictorial. A regathering in unbelief, because they're still filled with the impurities of brass and tin and iron lead. And the purpose of bringing them into the time of the wrath of tribulation is for the purpose of purging these uh, bad things out of their system as they come to faith. And once they come to faith, then they shall know the Lord, 
and only then will they come to the final restoration. But again, notice the regathering and unbelief in preparation for judgment, and specifically the judgment of tribulation. And this is where the modern Jewish state would fit. For a third example, let's go to the prophet Zephaniah. The prophet Zephaniah. Zephaniah chapter one initially. Now Zephaniah chapter one beginning in verse seven through the end of chapter verses seven through 18. He describes a period of time which he calls the day of Jehovah or the day of the Lord. Now that specific term is the most common biblical term in both testaments for we now simply refer to as the tribulation. So the most common term today is tribulation, great tribulation, but the most common biblical term is the day of Jehovah, the day of the Lord. In chapter one points out what a terrible period of time that will be. When he finishes describing the day of the Lord, what he does in chapter two is describe an event that must precede the day of the Lord, that must precede the um, tribulation period. Chapter two, verse one, Gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation that hath no shame, before the decree bring forth, before the day passes the chaff, before the fierce anger of Jehovah come upon you, before the day of Jehovah's anger come upon you. As not as before there can be the day of the Lord hitting the world, there must be a regathering of Israel. It's a regathering in unbelief because they're not yet ashamed of their sins. And the purpose of bringing them into the time of the divine wrath is so they do, they do become ashamed of their sins and finally uh, find their Messiah. But once again, notice the regathering unbelief in preparation for judgment. So these are examples of what the modern Jewish state does indeed fulfill. That's three, let's go to the plus one, and let's go to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. The entire context begins in chapter 11, verse 11, through chapter 12, verse six. 11, 11, through chapter 12, verse six. And what he's describing is the second worldwide regathering in faith in preparation for blessing, the final one. So why are we turning to this again? Let me mention that fourth perspective because the fourth perspective does recognize what the first three perspectives did not. The Bible does speak of two different kinds of worldwide regatherings, one in unbelief and one in faith. But having recognized it thus far, they go on to say something else. We cannot be sure that a modern Jewish state is a fulfillment of these uh, prophecies, and why not? Because in their perspective, you can have a regathering unbelief followed by dispersion, another regathering unbelief followed by dispersion, and even another regathering unbelief followed by dispersion before you have the specific one that fulfills these prophecies. But that's, that's what exactly Isaiah will tell us cannot be. Now once again, he's describing that final worldwide regathering in faith and preparation for the blessings of the kingdom. But notice how he numbers the last worldwide regathering, verse 11 of chapter 11. It shall come to pass in that day, the Lord will set his hand again the second time to recover remnant of his people that shall remain from Assyria and from Egypt and from Patros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamat and from the islands of the sea. He will set up an ensign for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. As he mentions the final worldwide regathering in faith in preparation for the blessings of the kingdom, notice how he numbers the last regathering. He says it is the second one. If the last one is the second one, how many more can you have before that one? If with new math, only one. And the point is the Bible allows only for two worldwide regatherings. 
Now, the first one was not a something, the return from Babylonian captivity. That was not a regathering from the four corners of the earth. That was the migration from one country, Babylonia, back to another, Judea. But here we're dealing with two worldwide regatherings. Only two are allowed. And then the first one is the one we have seen with the present Jewish state. Now go to page two of your outline. Let's go to the plus three. And turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter nine. Daniel chapter nine. Now the first corollary issue is the start of tribulation and what must precede the start of the tribulation. At the beginning of verse 24 and going to verse 27, verses 24 through 27 of Daniel chapter 9, he's the, he is giving his famous prophecy of the 77s or the 490 year period that God has decreed over the Jewish people. It goes beyond our purpose to go through the whole passage phrase by phrase, because now dealing with the specific topic we are dealing with tonight. But for those of us involved in Jewish messianic ministries, this is a very important passage to know well, because this is the only prophecy that provides a timetable for the first coming of the Messiah. If you have done it or will do it on your own, that's what you learn is this. By the time you come to the end of verse 26, the first 483 years of this 490 year period has already been fulfilled historically, coming to an end at the time of the first coming. But there's still seven years left to run of this prophetic time clock of Israel. And these are the same seven years of the tribulation. And now the question we raise is this, what will be that one singular event that will begin the seven years taking away and that brings us to verse 27 of Daniel 9, and he shall make a firm covenant with many for one seven. Now the pronoun he goes back to his nearest antecedent, which is in verse 26 as the prince that shall come. In other words, the prince that shall come of verse 26, and the he makes a covenant in verse 27, is the same individual, better known our circles are simply the Antichrist. Now Daniel does use a definite article in verse 26, the prince, because he spoke of him twice before, first in chapter seven and again in chapter eight. This is the third time makes a reference to him. So what verse 27 shows is that the tribulation cannot start until there's a signing of a seven year covenant. There must be the signing of a seven year covenant that begins the tribulation. This requires for two things to be in place. One is, one is not. What is not yet in place is that this requires uh, the Antichrist to have been high political authority before the tribulation with whom a sovereign state like Israel could sign a covenant of this nature. And um, this has not yet taken place. The second thing this presupposes is that there is a Jewish state with a Jewish government with whom a covenant this could be signed. And that has been true as of 1948. And so, so the first prerequisite for the tribulation to begin requires Israel to exist, and we have such a state. And not the way the modern Jewish state fits within the realm of Bible prophecy. Now the second thing, capital B, the third temple and the abomination of desolation. I want to read four passages in sequence, one after the other, and then I'll make my observations. Back to Daniel 9, 27. He shall make a firm covenant many for one seven, and in the middle of the seven, he will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And upon the wing of abominations shall come what makes desolate, and even to the full end and that determined, shall wrath be put out upon the desolate. Second passage will be Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24.
and verse 15. Matthew 24, verse 15. When therefore you see the abomination of desolation which is spoken of to Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, let the reeds understand, then let them in Judea flee unto the mountains. As I may have mentioned this previously, but one of the questions I get nowadays is, is our president possibly the Antichrist? My response is he may fulfill the prophecy here in verse 15 about the Obama nation of desolation, but no, he's not the Antichrist as such. Third passage would be 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thess chapter 2. Second Thess chapter 2, verse 3, Second Thess chapter 2, verse 3. Let no, male, no, let no man beguile you in any wise, for it will not be, except the falling away come first, and the man of sin be revealed, the sin of perdition. He who opposes and exalts himself against all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits in the temple of God, setting himself forth as God. And now the fourth passage will be Revelation 11. Revelation chapter 11. Revelation 11 verse 1, Revelation 11 verse 1. And there was given me a reed, like unto a rod, that once said, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein, but the crowd which is outside the temple, leave it out and measure it not. For it has been given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Now all four passages speak about the event the Bible calls the abomination of desolation. Now what that is, is when the, is, is an event that takes place at the midpoint of the tribulation, the Antichrist will take over the city and the, and the temple compound. He will seat himself in it, proclaim himself to be God Almighty, and call upon the whole world to worship him as God, and, and to signify their acceptance of his deity by taking his mark of 666. When they hear of this event, they must get out of Israel and get out of Israel quickly. Now that is an event that occurs at the midpoint of the tribulation, so how is that directly relevant to our present study about the modern Jewish state? Well, first of all, what these prophecies show is this. At the middle of the tribulation, the temple is both standing and functioning. By the mid-seven-year period, mid-trip period, it is standing and functioning. But furthermore, we also, that also means that it must be rebuilt before the middle of the tribulation. And that gives us two possible options. One option is that the temple might be rebuilt in the first half of the tribulation. A second option is that it might be rebuilt even before the tribulation starts. We cannot make it more specific than that. It might be rebuilt before the tribulation starts, so it might wait till, till the first half of the tribulation, but by the midpoint it is standing and functioning. Now all of that presupposes Israeli sovereignty over the temple compound. That did not happen back in 1948. Israel did become a state in 1948, but the city of Jerusalem was split in two. The Jewish people got to keep the newer part, which is the west side. But the biblical Jerusalem, the old city, and the temple compound was on the east side that fell under Jordanian sovereignty. It remained under Jordanian sovereignty for 19 years, from 1948 until 1967. One of the byproducts of the Six Day War is, only then did the um, temple compound fall under Israeli sovereignty. Only then was it even possible to rebuild the temple. So these prophecies clearly show there must be Israeli sovereignty of the temple compound, and now there is such a sovereignty since 1967, and not the way the modern Jewish state will fit within the realms of Bible prophecy. Now, uh, periodically rumors break out that the temple has been, uh, is in the process of being rebuilt. I first heard such a rumor, I was in Israel 
as a student at Hebrew University during the Six Day War, I came back to the U.S. Uh, two months after the war ended. And suddenly, everywhere I went to different churches, they were believing a rumor that the Jews were importing stones from Bedford, Indiana, to rebuild the temple. I knew it could not be true, but it's amazing how many people actually believed that rumor. You don't have to spend much time in Israel to realize something very quickly. The last thing is to ever need to import from anywhere, the stones. <laughs> tons that every time they want to plant a new field and have a new settlement, they must clear tons and tons of rock. And the Jewish Talmud has an explanation why there is so much stone or rock in Israel. And the story is that God made all the rocks at one time and put them in two bags. He gave one bag to one angel, one to the other, and they were both to spread out the rocks evenly around the world. The first angel went out, and that's what he did. The rocks were scattered throughout evenly around the world. When the second angel began to fly out in the floor of Israel, the bag ripped. <laughs> and half the world's rocks fell down to Israel. That's why there was so much rock there. Furthermore, simply by rabbinic law, the stones for the temple must be mined from the hill country of Judah and not from Bedford, Indiana. The temple is not yet being built, but there are three other things happening in preparation for the temple. Um, first of all, there is a group called the Temple Mount Institute based in the Jewish quarter of the old city. And um, they are making all of the different uh, furnitures and fashions for the temple. I take my groups to Israel. We take a group, we take a tour every May for three to five weeks. It's so make an appointment for them to uh, see this uh, new work. And they've pretty well done everything they need for the temple. They have all the pots and pans for the blood sacrifices. They have the um, table of showbread. They have the golden lampstand. They have um, these the, the uh, lots for the scapegoat, the clothing for the common priest and the high priestly garments and so on. So once the temple is finally rebuilt, it can bring all these things into the temple building to so function fairly quickly. A second group is called the Aterita Kohani, meaning the crown of the priesthood. They're based inside the Muslim quarter within the old city. And what they're doing is training descendants of Aaron to do proper sacrifices. Now most tribes do not know, well, most Jews do not know what tribe they're from. Um, I do not know what tribe I'm from. Some of my friends have suspect um, I come from an ancient Jewish Indian tribe called the Shmohawks. <laughs> but that's just their view. But, the, um, but the most Jews do not know what tribe they're from. But the one tribe that's kept their identity, the tribe of Levi. In Jews named Levi, Levine, Levinson, Levinthal, or some form of that name, are members of the tribe of Levi. But not all Levites could be priests. Only those who happen to be direct descendants of Aaron could be priests. So Jewish people named Cohen, that might be spelled as K-A-H-N, C-O-H-N, C-O-H-E-N, that's the Hebrew word for priest, Cohen. Undertaken is Orthodox Jewish Cohens and trained them to do proper sacrifices. So when the temples were built, their people prepared to do proper sacrifices. A third group is trying to produce that perfect red heifer. The rules of the red heifer are found in the book of Numbers, chapter 19. Numbers 19. And basically, in the mosaic law is to be primarily a reddish brown cow. But rabbinic law made it more stringent. It cannot have more than two white hairs or two black hairs. About 15, maybe 20 years ago now, there was all kinds of rumors being spread that they have the perfect red heifer. But the red heifer was killed only at the age of three years old. By the time that heifer was three years old, had over, had, had over 10 black hairs and got disqualified. Now, if you know about, I've uh, seen Hollywood movies, you'll recall if there's a major problem in the world, just sent in the Texas Rangers to solve it. In this case, it was a Texan rancher who had several perfect red heifers. He shipped them to Israel to provide them with red heifers. You would think that would solve the problem except for another issue of, of rabbinic stringency. Under the rabbinic law, for the cow to be kosher, to be the red heifer, it must be born in Israel. It cannot be born in Texas. <laughs> it must be a Jewish cow. It cannot be a Gentile cow. I guess it has to be a Holstein, not, a, not an Angus. 
Now, what they're doing with these red heifers in Israel is using genetic engineering to try to um, produce the perfect red heifer. Romans have spread that they have done that, except uh, it hasn't been verified by that group or the other group, so right now it's only a rumor, and many of these rumors tend to be false. So while the temple building itself is not yet uh, going up, three other things are happening in preparation for it, and not the way the uh, Jewish state fits within the realm of Bible prophecy. Also in your outline, I skipped it, uh, we'll come back to it here. What about the Ark of the Covenant? And there's a misconception among many Christians that the temple cannot function without the Ark of the Covenant. And because of that misconception, you got different Christian groups scouring the world trying to find the Ark of the Covenant. And three different people have claimed to have found it. The trouble is the one found it in Jerusalem, another one found it in Jordan, the third one found it in Ethiopia. So there must be some reasonable facsimiles thereof. None of them can produce a picture of it, none of them can produce evidence that they've seen it, but that's, what, that's just one of those um, things that people spread. But the uh, fact is you don't need to have the Ark of the Covenant to the temple to function because the second temple functioned for six centuries with no Ark of the Covenant. The second temple was built in the year 515 BC, destroyed in AD 70, functioned for, six, uh, for six, um, 600 years without the Ark of the Covenant. What they did was put a foundation stone from the Solomonic Temple in the Holy of Holies to sprinkle the blood upon that foundation stone. And uh, furthermore, if you look at the details about the Millennial Temple, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 16, Jeremiah 3, 16 states, there will be no Ark of the Covenant in the Millennial Temple. Now, they rebuilt the temple, the second temple, only 70 years after the first temple was destroyed. They could not find the ark after 70 years. They would not be able to find it after 2,500 years. It's not essential for the temple to function. Most likely, the ark of the covenant made by Moses never survived the Babylon destruction. Because the Bible gives a list of things that Nebuchadnezzar took with him to Babylonia. It says, the rest he burned with fire. That'll probably include the Ark of the Covenant. For Babylonian viewpoint, what was the Ark? A box of wood overlaid with gold. They simply stripped the gold and uh, burned the wood. And uh, so um, there's no need to worry about finding the Ark for the temple to function. But all of these things show the preparations for something the Bible clearly says will happen in the future. That's how the modern Jewish state fits with the realm of Bible prophecy. Now the third element, let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 38. Ezekiel chapter 38. Ezekiel chapter 38 verse 1 going through chapter 39 verse 16. Describes an invasion of Israel, the Gog and Magog invasion. Now goes beyond our, uh, our topic for tonight deal to deal with all of the specific nations that this involves. We've talked about that in our first Thursday of the series. I just want to focus on two passages that describe the kind of Israel that, uh, uh, that will exist when this invasion occurs. And point one, the Israel of Ezekiel 38 and 39, look at chapter 38, verse eight. 38, verse eight. After many days you shall be visited. In other years you shall come into land that is brought back from the sword, get out of many peoples upon the mountains of us, which have been a continuous waste, but now brought forth other peoples, and they shall dwell securely, all of them. Skip down to verse 12. Verse 12. To take the spoil, to take the prey, to turn your head against the waste places now inhabited, against the people that gathered out of the nations, the garden and goods, and dwell in the middle of the earth. The kind of Israel he describes, notice, are made up of Jewish people that have come together from all the different nations around the world. A people that return to the land after escaping the sword. A people that come back to a land where the cities lay desolate and waste for centuries, now being rebuilt and re-inhabited. He's not describing any kind of Israel which existed in ancient times. The first time we have this kind of Israel is as of 1948. 
As of 1948, this is the kind of history we now have. There are five different perspectives that are in, our, in our own circles as to the timing of this invasion, but whatever, one thing should be very clear, regardless of the viewpoint, that this invasion could not have happened before 1948. There was no such Jewish state existing before 1948. Now point two, the place of the destruction of the invading armies. Look at chapter 39, verse two. Chapter 39, verse two. I will turn you about and will lead you on and will cause you to come up in the uttermost parts of the north. I'll bring you upon the mountains of Israel. Then verse four. Then you shall fall upon the mountains of Israel. Let me repeat what I said the first Thursday two weeks ago. He talks about the mountains of Israel. That is the term for the central mountain range of, uh, of the state of Israel. It forms like a backbone upon the length of the country. These mountains begin at the south end of the Galilee, the south end of the Jezreel Valley. It runs the, the length of the country. It finally peters out a few miles north of Beersheba. In these mountains, you have many of Israel's famous cities of the Bible. You have Dothan, you have Samaria, you have Shechem, you have Ai, Bethel, Ramam, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Debir, and so on. Now from 1948 to 1967, the mountains of Israel were not in Israel. They're under Jordanian sovereignty. And so what, when you hear about the news media calling the land called the West Bank, what the news media calls the West Bank is what Ezekiel calls the mountains of Israel. Now from 1948 to 1967, Israel had only 5% of these mountains, 95% were under Jordanian sovereignty. And the border between Israel and Jordan ran along the further mountains. It then cut inside, cut Jerusalem in two out again, and then around the mountains of Israel again. Now one of the, another, another product of the Six Day War back in 1967 was only then that the mountains of Israel fall in Israeli sovereignty. Only then did it become a political issue for Israel and remains a political issue for Israel to this very day. But uh, so these, the, the second prophecy shows that the not only could not this invasion occur before 1948, it could not happen before 1967 either. At that point, these mountains were not a political issue for Israel. But, no, but now it is setting the stage for this, for this invasion at some point in God's timetable. And so this is not the way the modern Jewish state fits within the realm of Bible prophecy. So again, in dealing with the question, does Israel fulfill Bible prophecy, we have to keep our balance. On one hand, we must not see more fulfillment than there really is. But at the other hand, we must not fail to see the fulfillment that is there. As we see a God is fulfilling his prophecies and promises to Israel, that should give us encouragement because we, the body of the Messiah, also have certain uh, promises made to us. And we covered one of these prophecies in detail a week ago, even with the rapture of the church. And keep on, always remember, our blessed hope is not looking for the Antichrist, looking for the tribulation, but rather our, our blessed hope is for him to come in the air and to, for him to resurrect the dead saints, catch up living saints, to take us into heaven, where he has prepared a place for us. And if, if he fulfills his promise to Israel, he'll fulfill that promise to us as well. Okay, before we have the questions, let me make a couple announcements. Last week I, I mentioned the Bible prophecy book and future prophecies. Let me point out the three books that deal with fulfilled prophecy. Uh, it's called Messianic Prophecy, concerning prophecies about the first coming. This one's called HaMashiach, the Messiah of the Hebrew Scriptures, and this, this deals with all of the first coming prophecies in the Hebrew Bible. What we've done is to put it together with Hebrew on one side, English on the other. We did that because our target audience is Jewish people who do not yet know the Messiah. And often they've been taught by the, the rabbis that when you're being witnessed to by an evangelical, just simply say, well, we learn from our rabbi that Christians have a trick Bible. <laughs> and the text in, in the Christian Bibles makes it sound like Jesus, but it's because they misinterpret the Hebrew and the Hebrew would not support that rendering. So if you're to a Jew, he might give that objection, then 
pull out this book and say, well, here's the Hebrew, can you show me what the mistranslation is? Now, most American Jews don't know any Hebrew, but even if they do, they wouldn't be able to see any mistranslations. It might open their door to further witness. Then using the same material, those of you that, that teach children, there are two, uh, two books that deal it, that do the um, same material for children. This is for the much younger children, Messian Prophecies for Children, and then for older children, Messian Prophecy for Kids. And so this will uh, communicate to them a bit uh, better for their younger age, and it's going to be for the adults. I mentioned when I talked about our summer school program in upstate New York that we run for six weeks, the last week is focused on the 25-hour version of the Life of Messiah, the Jewish perspective. That study is also available in DVD form, and um, it comes also with a student manual, and for a teacher, it comes with a teacher's manual. It covers the 25-hour version of this course. So if you want to sign up for these, uh, any of this material, just simply sign up at the back table. Um, I'll be mailing whatever you order tonight and tomorrow's um, mail, and I'll spill it rather quickly. Also, uh, you'll have a chance to order it the next week as well. Next week, because next week will be my last teaching session in the islands. I've been traveling now for three months, and, uh, and this will be the last meeting in the islands for this trip. And so if you want to buy the books off the table, you can do so. If you're going to reserve any of the books, uh, talk to the man behind the table, and this way I won't have to worry about getting back to Texas, but you're welcome to buy the books out of the table to, uh, a week from tonight. All right, let's uh, open the floor for questions. So who's got the first question tonight? Raise your hand and uh, wait for the mic to arrive. All right, we'll skip the first question. Who's got the second question tonight? <laughs> All right, just got the third question. There we go. Do we come back to the second and first one? Your questions don't need to be limited to what we cover. You're welcome to ask any question from any part of the Bible you would like. Are they planning to sacrifice in the temple? In the millennium? Uh, are they planning to do animal sacrifices in the temple? Are you asking about the millennial temple? Um, the uh, temple that they want to build. Well, but, but as far as the third temple, the tribulation temple, they don't believe in the messiahship of Jesus, so they're going to go back to the mosaic system. Oh. And, all, and they cannot sacrifice without a temple, which is what they want to build a temple, and go back to the mosaic system. As far as the millennial temple, there'll be a sacrificial system there, but won't be the mosaic system. There are too many differences and contradictions. There'll be a system based upon kingdom law and not based upon the mosaic law. I was just wondering about... Um when Jesus Christ had um, died on the cross, um, did that put an end to all sacrifices? It put an end to all the sacrifices insofar as the Mosaic system. But, um, but what you could not offer after Jesus died was to offer a blood sacrifice for atonement, per se. Look at Acts 21, what does Paul do? He offers a votive sacrifice. A votive sacrifice, sacrifice you give at the end of a vow. And he, and, uh, and he clearly taught the freedom from the law, but he saw no act of contradiction roughly about a sacrifice. So that there are other purposes of sacrifices than the atonement. And so there was no basis after Christ died to, to offer atonement sacrifices based upon the Mosaic law. But there are other sacrifices you could offer that were not relevant to the atonement issue, like Paul did. Question? Any other questions? Any last questions? All right, we'll have our grand finale next week, so thank you very much. Oh, here's a question. <laughs> Are you a rabbi story? My problem is I kept, I never write the rabbi stories down that I told where. I'm always afraid that I might be repeating the uh, story. Did I tell any stories during these previous two Thursdays? They tell about the Taliban terrorist? I didn't? Okay. This is a story about a Taliban terrorist, not a rabbi story, but it's a, there's a Jewish connection. He's fleeing the authorities. He's running through a desert. He's running the water, and he is, um, he's getting desperate. 
looks out in a difference and he thinks he sees what may be an oasis. And if it is an oasis, or oh, every oasis has water. When he gets the realizes there's not an oasis, there's no water there, all he sees is an old Jewish man selling ties. So the terrorist asked the Jewish man, don't you have any water here? The Jewish man says, I have no water. I have all these nice ties, only five American dollars a piece. The terrorist says, I don't want your Western clothing. I'm an Easterner, I'm, and what I want is some water. The Jewish man says, well, like I said, I have no water. I have this nice silk tie, only five American dollars. The Taliban terrorist says, I like to, I wish I had the strength right now to take this time and put on your neck and just kill you. I hate Jews, I want to kill Jews since I was a kid, but I need to reserve my energy. I need to find some water. The Jewish man says, well, I'll show you I'm a better man than you are. You hate me because I'm Jewish. You call me an infidel. You will not buy any of my ties. I'll show you I'm a better man than you are. You can make it about one more kilometer through the sand dunes. You'll come to a crossroads. There's a restaurant there. And uh, it's a nice restaurant that has all the water you could possibly want to drink. So go in peace and may God bless you. The terrorist walks away. He um, yells out, I may come back and kill you yet, but I need to preserve energy. He goes away for a while, but after a while he comes back. He's come back crawling on his hands. He's crawling on his knees. He's got this five dollar in his head. And he says, they will not let me in without a tie. <laughs> I'll give you another short one, which is a rabbi story. There's a rabbi that is trying very hard to win the lottery. Week after week passes, he does the win. The week starts, he prays, Lord, let me win the lottery this week. The week ends, he does, does the win. After one for a long time, he just got desperate and says, Lord God of Israel, can't you just give me a break and let me win the lottery? And he hears the voice of God saying, why don't you give me a break and at least buy a ticket? Well, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. And uh, let's end in a word of prayer. Lord God, you are such an awesome God. Thank you so much for your word. Your word confirms our faith is right, and you will come again for us. And we're looking forward to that day, Lord. Maranatha, come quickly. This world is getting worse and worse every day. Let us be prepared for you as a bride is prepared for her groom. For we are your bride, Lord. Let there not be a spot or wrinkle in us because you want to see your son in us when you come again. Let that be true for each and every one of us. In your precious name we pray, amen.